man of God and the bear came out of the woods? Because of Christina's post this week. But then it wouldn't be fair to you folks that are appreciative of your pastor. And I'd be just excluding out a few to preach to them. Look at all the guilty looks. But we'll be in chapter 14 of Luke. Chapter 14 of Luke. Chapter 14 of Luke. Chapter 14. I, I want to read several verses of Scripture. My, my thought only comes from a few. And I'll ex explain as we move on. Chapter 14, verse 1. Starts with a conjunction. It says, And it came to pass as he went into the house, this is Christ, of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. That, that, so I, I feel good. Uh, my messages over the course of the last few weeks have been observations. And uh, everybody watched him. I think we could do a whole lot more watching it might help us sometimes. Most of my learning from the Scriptures, if I can say this, um, has been watching, observation. Obviously, I wasn't there when they wrote the Bible, but boy, there's a sure, sure lot of things I can learn uh, just looking at what other people have learned in there. And they watched him. And it says in verse 2, And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers, and Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go. And he answered them saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they didn't have to answer for him. He was going to. And they could not answer him again to these things. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. Now there is a lot going on in this situation. There is a chief Pharisee. He's invited Christ uh, to his home. I've told this story many a times. Mom and I used to have a rule of thumb. Uh, the first folks that invite you when you're candidate in a church will usually be the people that cause you the biggest problems. That's just, I've come to understand that. Candidated several churches. Um, it's troublesome sometimes because you meet somebody when you show up at the church to candidate and they're very friendly and they're very nice. And uh, how many times have I said this before, Mom, and then all of a sudden they invite you. I probably was invited, I don't know how many churches to candidate when I was in Bible college. And I didn't know that the first one, but it just seemed to, to, to unfold as, as time went on. And I've, I've said to her before, I said, man, I was so disappointed those folks just asked us to come over to eat. I said, weren't they such nice folks? Now you might sit there and say, well, that, 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 that's an oxymoron. Yeah, until you figure out that those ones, the chief Pharisee invites you over to eat, and then next thing you know, they're the ones that are just, I think they're fattening you up to, to make the sacrifice. That's exactly what's happening here. There's no stretch of the imagination here. A certain Pharisee, I'm going to try and show you some things that are taking place around here, comes to one of the chief Pharisees. While this is all taking place, there's someone there that has uh, the dropsy. And Jesus answering, spake unto the lawyers and the Pharisees. They were invited there. So we have lawyers we have Pharisees that are there, and he asked them a question. Obviously, he didn't. Uh, they must have been running for office. They didn't want to answer the question. Verse 4, they held their peace. He, he took him, healed him, and let him go. And without even the answer, and this is what's so great about the Lord, he, they didn't need to answer him. He already knew what their answer was going to be. He answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things because they would and they had proven they would. Held possessions in much greater uh, uh, esteem than they did people. He put forth a parable to those which were bidden. Now watch this now. Watch what else is taking place in there. When he marked how they chose out the chief rooms saying unto them. Now obviously there was lawyers there. It was the law offices of 
Morgan, Peterson, and Johnson. See how I did that? No Morgans in here, no Petersons, no Johnsons. That was thinking on the hoof right there, buddy. It was the law offices of Morgan, Peterson, and Johnson, and obviously one of them was the one that was the highest of them. So when they come in, obviously they're going to sit down and take one of those chief seats. Also, there's religious leaders that were there. So he begins to give them a parable, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. Boy, isn't that embarrassing to pick out a seat, and next thing you know, somebody else comes, and you have to move your seat. He says, He bade thee, and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, when he bade thee cometh. He may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher, then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. Now, what, who's the highest ranking person in that meeting that day? Christ. I'm sure they didn't make a lot of room for him. They, I think, and this is just lovedology, if you will, I think that they were kind of trying to trick him. I think they were doing some things to trick him in front of their lawyer friends, in front of their pharisaical friends, and they're going to sit there and we're going to trip this guy up and we're going to, we're going to embarrass him in front of all these highfalutin people. And if we embarrass him in front of all these highfalutin people, maybe he'll just disappear and get out of here. That's just me. Verse 11, he says to them, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now that must have been really hard to hear because just by mere position there was people in that room that had a position of exaltation. If they had other people that were there in their law offices, their position denoted. Now you don't always have to exalt yourself in your position. Your position will do it for you. If you'll humble yourself in your position, it makes a whole lot more sense. And there's a whole lot of other things going on in here. There was obviously religious people there that just by mere fact of their position, they've exalted themselves. Some of the best leaders I found in the military, whether they were ranking officials or generals or whatever that I was able to rub shoulders with, were those that were more concerned about their troops than they were about themselves. These people here, I believe Jesus posed this to them because they were more concerned about themselves than they were the troops, and we'll see it as it unwinds in here. It said in verse 12, Then said he also to him that bade him. Now this is the person now he's talking to that bade him to this great feast that he's had there. When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again and recompense be made thee. And there are so many rabbits I could chase in all of this situation. There's also a part of me that believes they wanted to see if he was going to be the one, like Barabbas, that would restore the kingdom. The reason they chose Barabbas over Jesus was they didn't understand the long-term effects of the decisions they were making. They were looking for short-term effects, and therefore that's why they said, give us Barabbas and not Jesus. Barabbas wanted to enter in the kingdom. He, he was a rebel rouser. He wanted to get Rome out of power. And now this man's sitting here talking about a kingdom and so on and so forth. So they're trying to see if he's somebody they can work with. Boy, that didn't work out very well, did it? Verse 13, But when thou makest a feast, he said, Call the, the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Now he's telling them exactly who he's came. He's came, remember he stands up in the synagogue and he reads the scriptures and he says, for this day the scriptures are fulfilled. I've come to heal the uh, sick and restore the blind and all that. You know the verse of scripture. I'm sorry I wasn't able to quote it. But he's sitting there, he says, rather, those are the people he was bidden. He's showing a contrary to what they were doing. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. He says, and thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt recompense at the resurrection the just. And there's a lot of, uh, within our own ranks in Christianity, how we just tip the hat to other people. Uh, we, we many times fault the, 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 the political leaders of the day. And can I just say this? I've seen more politics in pulpits than I ever have from Washington, D.C., just an observation. Then said he, verse 16, or verse 15, he says, And when one of them sat at meat, no, I missed it. he said, And thou shalt, verse 14, be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. 
He says, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these sayings, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And I think here's their piety showing forth again. Who are you to say of us? We're the religious. We know what we're doing. We will. We're the sons of Abraham and so on and so forth. You've heard it before. Then said he unto him, verse 16, A certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. Verse 19, we have another group or another person rather, said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. Boy, there's a lot of eyes in these passages of Scripture. And I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Verse 20, and another said, I have married a wife. There we go. There we go. If nothing else fails, i got to get home to mama. <laughs> And therefore I cannot come. Now I'm not going to read into that. Maybe she just wouldn't let him do anything. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't want to read into it. There's a lot of assumptions that can be made. But he posed the last of the three excuses and says, I've married a wife. And therefore, he, he didn't say he may not come. He said, I just cannot come. So that servant came and shewed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither. And he reiterates it again. The poor, I, I would dare say there was very few poor there that day. Christ was there and the Bible says foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. He was very poor in his physical man, but boy, he was rich in his spiritual man, wasn't he? So he says to him, go out, into the, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. What a sad testimony. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in. Now, I don't know what that means, but that compel has some strong emphasis to make sure you've got to come for this. You've got to see this. And compel them to come. Why? That my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And there went, that must have been some tough stuff to listen to that day. Because he's making a correlation between what you're doing today and you've invited and look at who you haven't invited and look at why you've invited them. That's what's so difficult sometimes in listening to some of the conversation that Christ carries on. He knows all the factors. When, they, when, when he knows what they've wrote for the Feast of Abus, Feast of Tabernacles, and he writes in the sand, he knows, he, he knows that they'd get their ox or their ass out of the ditch if it got stuck but wouldn't uh, try and help somebody else that was lame and halt and blind and so on and so forth. Boy, that's tough when you have a conversation with Christ and he knows everything. There's not much you can refute there. He says, For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And, and there's a part of me, and I, I hope I'm not making too many assumptions, there's a part of me when he says that, he's making an emphasis, and they must be scratching their heads because they have they've no Scripture. And they must be scratching their head. Here he goes again, making this claim that he's creating a great supper, and he's inviting everybody to come, and really that supper's only for us that are the children of Israel, and I hope he's not making a complaint. You ever heard somebody preach? You ever heard somebody tell a story, and sometimes you wonder, is he? Is he talking about me there? I say unto you, verse 24, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children, man, these are tough words, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. I'm sure that 
those people that were there that day, even people that were outside that day wanting to be in there that didn't get invited, must have followed him because he was saying things that weren't normal to be said. And they follow him, and he says, hey, hey, here's some options that you have. If you can't do this, you cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending, I'll just read the whole chapter in case you see something that I didn't. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he says he cannot be my disciple. He said, salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill. But men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Boy, there's a lot of conversations taking place this morning here. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to help us this morning. Lord, there's so many things transpiring in this text. I, I feel like some, sometimes, where, where do I jump in? What can I glean from it? Who can I pay more attention to? Uh, there's so many people, there's so many principal, uh, principles to be discussed here. But help us this morning with this one passage of Scripture that's on my heart that I believe you place there. Let us pull something from it, some eternal truth that can help us this morning. I realize again, Lord, as always, that you don't need me. I pray you touch me and help me and use me. Empty me of self, forgive me of my sins. Help me to handle the Word of God correctly. And may somebody in here this morning that you speak to their heart be eternally changed. I plead. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I have been intrigued, interested, captivated, I guess you could say, or I reckon you could say in recent days by conversations that take place in Scripture. It seems like right after Sunday, and when I start praying and concentrating upon what I could or should say next, uh, three messages never stop. <laughs> They're like a, what's that? There's four things that are never satisfied. Is that what Solomon said in Proverbs? One is a fire. You just got to keep putting wood on it. Uh, I, I don't know. The Bible says that Solomon was a preacher, I guess you could say. Uh, there's some things that I could add to that and add to his proverb if I was writing them. Uh, there's one other thing that's never satisfied, and that's the congregation uh, with messages. You've got to constantly, every week, come up with messages. Sometimes it becomes overwhelming to me. You know, where do I go now? It's, it's easy sometimes. Uh, we have the Wednesday night Proverbs, but sooner or later we're going to get out of Proverbs. We're on 20, and there's only 31 of them. I thought for sure I'd be able to finish my 10 years pastor doing the Psalms, there was 150 psalms, but after that I'm going to have to go somewhere else. And it's always consumption. There's always more we could, how many, I have volumes and volumes of messages in my uh, library, in my office in there. But Monday morning, it never fails. Here lately, I've been coming in on mornings, Monday mornings. Uh, Brother Robert O and I sit down many times and have conversations on Tuesday. Sometimes those conversations get very lengthy. We're trying to plan. We're trying to... Uh, didn't, didn't this year's theme go right down the pot? 2020 vision? I wish I would have known in February I was blind as a bat. But either way, you have to continue to. And the thing that is, I guess, allured me here lately is conversations in Scripture. More importantly, conversations... Uh, specifically that Christ had throughout his time on earth. I think there's a lot of things you can learn. Remember this, before the canonization of scriptures, all the disciples had really, I know they had the Old Testament, and that, that is very good, sufficient, but they didn't have the New Testament. And most of us, if we'd be honest, where, where do we spend most of our time? In the New Testament. But what they did have, when they didn't have what we sometimes take for granted, they did have the Word of God talking to them on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And if you look at all of Christ's conversations, he is always discipling. I call it situational discipleship for every situation. And you, you feel free. I think you have to develop that with your acquaintances, your friends, your family, your children. You have to learn how to situational disciple. Take a situation and know the Scriptures and teach something from the Scriptures for them that will make an eternal impact. And so I've been, I guess you could say, interested in, captivated by those conversations that Christ had, specifically while He had time on this earth. Can you imagine for a moment, if you will, talking to Christ? Let's think about that. If He were to come in, in the midst of your job, in the midst of your family, in the midst of whatever, in the midst of a meal. Uh, I'll tell you what, you, you want to get some laughs, come to the Lovett house when we all sit down at the table. Or some of y'all have been part and parcel of that. It can be very humorous, but here it is with Christ. Can you imagine for a moment talking to Him at this situation? I think as many people as are critical of preachers sometimes you'd probably be just as critical sitting in a situation like that. Someone would say, he was invited to this meal. Why would he do this? Why would he make these kind of comparisons at this meal? That is not very ethical. That's not proper decorum. You ought to be appreciative that somebody comes. But see, watch this. He was more appreciative or wanting more so of their eternal soul than he was a temporary meal. I think sometimes we pacify people too much to their harm. Can you imagine for a moment, if you will, talking to Christ? Actually, it shouldn't be too hard for a believer to imagine. It should take place daily. Frequently, actually, throughout the day and every day. I think if we walk in the Spirit enough that while we're in our day-to-day -day endeavors, the very things that He said at this meal could be said of us while we're eating. I don't think that's a stretch of Scripture. But imagine for a moment being an observer as the disciples were to daily conversations that he had. Oh boy, here he goes again. You know, I, I'm sure they sat in the background sometimes and said, you know, it'd be a whole lot easier if he just wouldn't be so confrontational. After a while, you'd get a sense of what was, let's say, important. Thus, the very reason I feel it is important to read the Scriptures, for in them we see, we hear, and we watch as Christ carries on conversations what is really important. I'm not someone that would say that there are filler words or filler stories or useless jibber-jabber in Scripture. There's nothing that's just trying to... When I went to college, Brother Miller, I used to... My computer program, I think it still does it, Word, Microsoft Word. You go down to the bottom and it tells you how many words you have. One of the things in one of my classes and when I was going for my master's degree... You had to write compositions, essays, whatever, and they gave you words. So it would be 200, 300, 400, 600. And it was, I guess, I never asked, the, the professor was trying to teach you that you could get something across in either very few or an awful lot of words. I wasn't successful at that, as you can imagine. Whew, some of y'all, is everything okay today? Is it... it Temperature okay? Some of y'all have just not been excited this morning. So I'm not someone that would say that there are filler words, but when I was in school, I used to put, I'd wait till it got to that number, and then it'd get to that number, and I'd have to go back, and I'd say, well, i got to take this out, i got to take this out, or i got to add this. The Scriptures aren't that. Everything that's found in the Word of God has a, all Scripture, here's, here's, a, here's a verse to verify that, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for reproof for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness how why so that the man of God may be that's not gender specific so that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished perfect unto all good works so I fully believe that in every word of the Bible lies an eternal truth that we should hear and heed and I'll even go as far as to say so much the more with every conversation we find in scripture between the Savior and some individual as I've said before there are many things you can learn while observing folks talk. That's a message for another day. I said last week that I do not believe that the story of the rich man and Lazarus was a parable, for it named people. It gave great detail in the account of the conversation. I'm actually of the persuasion that very few parables, this is just me, very few parables are not an actual account of some situation that Christ wanted to use to manifest a spiritual truth. He just 
I guess you could say, left the names out. How Dragnet used to say it, uh, the names are left out to protect the innocent. Here's the names are left out to protect the guilty. Either now or in the future, these parables that he speaks would be, I mean, here it is talking about the feast, and we know that there's going to be a great feast one day that takes place. And we're going to know that there's going to be many people that aren't going to be a part of that feast because they gave some great excuses. He knows the end from the beginning. And if so, then I'm sure he can as well share a story to emphasize the spiritual truth from an actual event that may take place in the future. So back to this parable of the wedding feast and great supper. It is an extremely important doctrine and as well future event. Uh, I have a nameplate there already. Whew, that was weak. I have a nameplate there already. Maybe you're not saying amen for me, but you ought to ask yourself, do you have a nameplate there? Is there a white stone awaiting you? Is there a book of remembrance? Is there a bottle of tears? There's all those things that are waiting. We know they're waiting because Scripture tells us they're waiting. The disciples do not yet have Scripture, but they have the Word made flesh. And thus he, Christ, is preparing them for their obligations as a servant. He's trying to teach. a two. They, he doesn't have Matthew 28 and 19 yet. It's not recorded in Scripture. It's, it, they, they don't have the opportunity to hear it and not heed it. He's telling them of the importance of all the things of why he called them and what their future mission was to be. So do I need to spend a lot of time this morning expounding or explaining or expressing the doctrinal foundation of these truths concerning the servant and his obligation to go tell people about the great feast? Or can I just jump to what stood out to me when I was, as the scripture says here in verse 1, that they watched him. I was watching from a distance. And I just want to jump to what stood out to me when observing this compelling conversation that he has. So with that being said, I want to preach on this thought this morning. And maybe we might make a series out of it. Observations from a compelling conversation. Verse 22, I pulled that word compel. Obviously, we're observing a conversation that took place, so there's no stretch of the imagination for the title. But if you come down here in verse 23, it says, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out unto the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in. And so Christ takes this opportunity in this conversation. Again, no idle words, no useless chitter-chatter. He was focused and to the point, and he was trying to elaborate an extremely spiritual, important spiritual truth to you and I this morning. Uh, can I reiterate over and over again, the volumes, the times I've preached in here, the things that are said from Scripture, the Sunday school classes that are taught, all the times where we take the spoken Word of God and try and pull something out of a conversation that He had to somebody else to compel us to do what we ought to know to do. I find these to be true observations from a compelling conversation. We pick up our observations while he is having a conversation. Watch this. I want to use verses 16 through 24. We pick up this, uh, our observations while he is having a conversation explaining the supper or the propriety of the supper, how you're to conduct yourself, and then shifts to the participants at the supper. We have two that he highlights Number one, the specific man. He says in verse 16, Then said he unto him, A certain man, just like how he did in Luke 16. Remember he said, A certain man fared sumptuously, clothed in fine linen and raiment, and so on and so forth. Then we see the other person that he highlights. It's not the specific man, but it's the servant messenger. Again, we could spend time on these two people, but my attention is, is not upon those and all the things that are around there, and there's several rabbits I could run this morning. I'm trying to stay focused. My attention is upon those that he sent his servant out as a messenger and invited. So the servant messenger goes out and he has a conversation of his own compelling those that he spoke with to come on behalf of the one that invited him. And it is thus where we'll make our observations, very simple observations, and yet simply profound and very telling. Let me give them to you. There's three. Number one, observations 
from a compelling conversation. Boy, I wish I could reiterate this morning how important every little conversation Christ has. For me this morning, I'm saved as a result of conversations not only that took place in Scripture, but conversations that took place in real life. I can put myself in here. I can put Rodney Pruitt in here. I can put Calvin Jeffcoat in here. I can put several people that witnessed to me through my years. And you know what he was doing? He was inviting me to something. Watch this. I don't want to distract. But he was inviting. If you go further up in the text, and these are things that I could have missed, and I'm sure I preached upon them in here because of my excuses. And boy, don't we have them. Brother Robito uses a phrase around here when we talk ministry sometimes. He says, it's not an excuse, it's a reason. Here's a reason why thus and thus and thus and so possibly. Now it doesn't excuse it, but it's a reason. And sometimes our reasons can be so real to us that it excuses the thing that awaits us. Watch this, and I notice in verse 10, these excuses that they give um, gets them to miss a friend. Watch this. He says, but when thou art bidden, verse 10, and go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher. I could go back to Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth in fear of his life that David was going to kill all the genealogy of Saul. He goes and invites him. An, an unnamed messenger goes out to where Lodabar, where Mephibosheth was, and calls him back. And he's so scared to death that he, he, he really doesn't deserve a seat at the king's table. But he gets a seat at the king's table. Not only does he get a seat at the king's table, the king's tablecloth covers up all of his infirmities. I don't know if that does anything for anybody else. Seems like some of y'all must, 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 must not be on the same page this morning. I'll say it. There's a lot of things we have in Christ. I'm going to tell you what, if somebody was here last week and was lost and got invited and missed that, you missed a friend. I'm going to have a friend. We sing the song sometimes. I don't know if we really understand the eternal impact of it. What a friend we have in Jesus. You miss a friend. Verse 13, you missed a feast. I've heard a lot of preachers through the years joke about this. This is going to be there. This is going to be there. This is going to be there. Surely this is going to be there. I'd like to think that Miss, 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 Miss Shaver's red velvet and orange cake is going to be there. And if Miss Cynthia keeps practicing, her cook sisters may be there one of these days. There's going to be a lot of things there for consumption. And guess what? With an excuse, you miss it. What was it that said in Scripture? I have not seen, earth not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. The Queen of Sheba said, the half ain't even been told. That was just Solomon's kingdom. You'll not only miss a friend, you'll miss a feast. Verse 15, you'll miss a future. This one that was at that place that day said, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. He said it almost sarcastically. Saying it sarcastically to the very one that was inviting him to come to the great feast. Not his feast, but the great feast. Now watch the things that people use as let's just call them excuses. Observations from a compelling conversation. <coughs> Very simple observation, yet simply profound, very telling. Number one, verse 18. First conversation that takes place, he's invited. Verse 18 says, And they all with one consent began to make excuses. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs, I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. First observation I made from this compelling conversation, for some folks their affairs can be more important. Their affairs can be more important. I'm amazed when I read my Bible since I've been saved at how foolish I was for so many years, refusing to come when compelled. And when it came right down to it, it fell under one of three excuses. Not only am I amazed at all the excuses I used, I used not to come, I wish I had a penny for all of those I've heard since I've come now, spending my time compelling others. 
I mean, you think about it. You, you almost have to prepare yourself on a visitation time to get ready to, for lack of a better term, combat the excuses. I mean, we had eight weeks of training here, Brother Colossa, and we came up with every possible scenario uh, that we could think of. But every time you go out, everybody has an excuse. For this man, with all with one consent, this first one said, I bought a piece of ground. I wish I had a penny for all of those I've heard since I've come. I won't bore you with all that I've heard, but I do want to read what a commentator stated about this specific excuse. I thought it was good enough to share. In regards to where he says, I must needs go, the commentator says, I have necessity, or I am obliged to go and see it. Possibly pleading a contract or an agreement that he would go soon and examine it. However, we may learn from this that sinners sometimes plead that they are under a necessity to neglect the affairs of religion. The affairs of the world, they pretend or are so pressing that they cannot find time to attend to their souls. They have no time to pray, no time to read the scriptures, no time to keep up with the worship of God. In this way, many lose their souls. God cannot regard such an excuse for neglecting religion with approbation, consent. He commends us to seek, and we sang it this morning. I thought how odd that was. Coincidental, I guess you could say. He commands us to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Nor can He approve any excuse that people may make for not doing it. I've come to realize it's truly sad as a pastor some days knowing what lies ahead and coming to that realization only to see countless make some form of poor excuse to seemingly excuse themselves of something so grand. Nothing can compare to what awaits the child of God. Nothing. I don't really teach on, touch on much eschatology. Because can I just be honest, it's hard to see sometimes. There's a crystal sea. There's a street of gold. There's a rainbow that's a full circle. Because now we're not waiting for and anticipating for and this covenant that God made, but we'll be in full view of it. We won't any longer walk by faith. We'll now walk by sight. We'll see it. And can I say this, if it's not for the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne and His, I guess you could say, elimination of past memories, we would sit there some days and say to ourselves over and over again, what in the world was I thinking? It's amazing sometimes how much we can just chase after things that have no eternal value and they think that they have eternal value and sacrifice them on the altar of our lives because we chase after them instead of chasing after God. Again, it's truly sad as a pastor some days knowing what lies ahead. You can ask somebody, am I going to see it, such and such? I've got some affairs, preacher. I've got, some, I've got a job obligation. I've got a situation here. I've purchased this. I, the, 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 the store the other day or the, the, the bank the other day told me I had to sign paper on such and such and the only time I could do it was such and such. I could come up with thousands and thousands of illustrations. I wish some days I was more dedicated so I could see God's uh, revelation of things He wants to do for me. When I was getting ready to go to the mission field, Mama, remember? There was a day, and I, I probably need to get back to it. I'm under conviction even saying it. There was a day many years ago that we didn't buy, sell, or trade on the Lord's Day. It was so important. It was so specific. Well, we had Sundays. We had to sell our house. And this realtor said, Sundays are such a great day. And I told her, I said, we won't do that on Sundays. But I'm missing out on all the opportunities to show your house. And right now, it's not a seller's market. There's too many properties out there for them to buy. And I said, this is what we're not going to do. Here's the days you can show it. One of them was a Friday. We left out. The first time she went to show it was a Friday. We left out to go to Wartburg, Tennessee to present the ministry. And I had 10 months left to sell the house. And I said, here's more than enough time with my reasoning. 
before we got to Tennessee from South Carolina, the realtor called on a Friday she showed it. Now, we didn't show it on any Lord's Days, no transactions, none of that stuff. She said, we missed out on all these opportunities. She lists the house. Within 10 hours later, it sold, done, finished. And I think it goes back to the very thing that we were singing this morning. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let me ask you this and we'll move on. Observations from a compelling conversation. If Christ were to talk to us today, would there be some of our folks in here that would say, my affairs are more important. Are your affairs more important than coming to the supper or compelling others to come? Can you imagine that there possibly can come a day, and I've said this, the greatest sin in the local church is the sin of omission. We omit to invite somebody else. We, we've got a place at the table. But then we forget to omit that the table still has plenty of room and we can invite somebody else. Are your affairs getting to the place where they've become more important than bidding others to come to Christ? I know that to be true. Watch this. Somebody take a picture of this morning and then take a picture tonight and then take a picture Wednesday. I don't need to hammer that point because I already know it to be true. The only thing I really need to hammer is the very fact that it's said and stated, God through the Holy Spirit will hammer it in your heart. Number two, verse 19. Second observation from a compelling conversation. The first one was, for some folks, their affairs can be more important. Number two, verse 19. For some folks, their assets can be more important. And another said, you know, I'd love to come. But you know what? I bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. You know, you even see the sobriety in, in the reply. Watch this now. Have you ever done this before? Somebody invites you to do something? Uh, Brother Mark, how many times have you, me and you just never can get together and he'll send me a picture. I hope you, are you okay with me sharing this? He'll send me a picture of some dried out piece of meat that he thinks he can cook on a barbecue. Talking to the pit master right here. No, I'm just kidding. He'll send, honestly, he'll send, he sent me a meatloaf the other day wrapped in bacon. He sent me all different kinds of stuff and he'll say, now this is what he does and, I, and I've, I've chastised him for this because he's just like some of my children I've got. Last minute inviters. And I'll say, man, I got this plan, I got that plan, I get this plan. And I feel like that sometimes. Here Brother Mark is bidding me to something. He shows the mouth-watering picture of it and then guess what? Something takes place. What takes place is my assets. We've got things we have to do, don't we? I, I'll, I'll pose this to him and I'll pose that to him. And all the fact of the matter is the mere fact that somebody invites. What can be more important than that? Now let me say this, the mere fact that Christ himself thought enough to invite us. What can be more important than that? As I watch from a distance these conversations, I was sadly reminded of so many I have had with so many I know and how they, like these, attempted to prove the importance of spending time concerning their possessions and no time concerning the person. Christ said it like this, and I'll move on, lest anyone would think I'm trying to be insensitive to someone's excuse. Matthew 6 and verse 19 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. I've got five yoke of oxen. I, I, I have to go prove them. I pray thee. He says he's, he's with sincerity of heart. He's saying this is so important to me. I'm praying you ethically. Would you please, please, please just have me excuse it. Okay, Mark, how many times have I apologized to you in all your invites? And this is what this, I see the sincerity. And many people, if you listen to them, they're very sincere. Preacher, I would come back to services. I would go on visitation. Preacher, I would be involved in that. I would teach a Sunday school class. I would participate in that. But something somewhere else. Some other asset has gathered their attention. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, that's the sad reality of it. 
I remember many years ago when we used to have, I'm trying to think of what somebody called it the other day, the paper system, envelope system. I think this, this preacher used the terminology. It was a young guy, and he used the envelope system. And I thought, what in the world? But the more he explained it, he realized he was talking about his dad who used to pay all his bills through the envelope system. <laughs> write checks, put it in an envelope, send it off, and so on and so forth. I'll never forget the first time a preacher said, he says, if you're having a struggle understanding what I'm saying this morning, if you care more for the things of this world than you do for the Lord, he says, I dare you to pull out your checkbook and look at your register. And he says, and there you'll find the answer to my question this morning. I went home. I pulled that thing out. I started looking down at all the transactions, and I said, oh, me. Observation number two from a conversation, a compelling conversation. For some folks, their, their assets, their assets can be more important. He said in verse 22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Jesus said, ye cannot serve God and mammon. Here's another. Christ often confronted and spoke of how our assets can hinder what should be our real adoration. Mark chapter 8 and verse 34, And when he called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel is the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Let me ask you this question. We'll move on. Have your assets... Let's say he was talking to us today. He was asking us these questions. In my observation, I asked myself these questions. Michael... Michael, has your affairs become more important? Michael, has your assets become more important? Let me ask you this and we'll move on. Have your assets as well become such a stumbling block that they have or could keep you from the Great Supper? Wouldn't you like, have, has there ever been time when you've read the Scriptures? Maybe it's just me. You read the Scriptures. Uh, it's kind of like going back to the, the Ebenezer Scrooge. The Christmas Carol. Isn't there a time, I'm trying to think, of which ghost of Christmas past came up to him, and he's in the back, and he's hovering over him as a younger man or a middle-aged man or whatever it is, and he's screaming to his younger self, trying to get attention, and younger self can't hear, and the ghost of whatever the Christmas Carol thing says to him, they can't hear you. Wouldn't you like to sometimes? I, I, I read this passage of Scripture and look at this conversation from a distance and I just want to sit there and say, as loud as I can, you do not know what you're missing. I don't even have a concept. Having been here and waiting for and anticipating the marriage supper of the Lamb, the great feast, the great supper, I do not even have a proper. But I'm going to tell you what, my mouth's watering. I'm going to tell you something else. Not only my, is my mouth watering, I'm just absolutely in awe in anticipation of who I get to sit next to. I love having conversations with people. Here's one thing I love to hear. I love to hear people's stories of how they get saved. I love to hear people's testimonies of what it took for them to come to Christ and the toils and the snares and all that kind of stuff. What... Could, could it be... Now watch this. I realize those cloud of witnesses are nothing but mortal flesh and over there there will be eternal beings in the image of Christ. But could you imagine you pull up and you sit down and... Well, we'll have the mind of Christ so we won't ask to, have to ask Him who He is. But just imagine for a minute, if, I, if you'll allow me to, give me some liberty, I'm sitting next to the Apostle Paul. I, get, I don't know where He's going to put me. Remember on Wednesday night I said, what you do here affects what you get there. Who's he going to sit me with? Where are you going to sit? Can you imagine just sitting down next to a Moses, a Joshua, a Caleb? One of the apostles, Peter, who Thomas. Boy, Thomas sitting there saying, Can you? And I go, what's going on? 
can, can, you, can you just for a minute realize that there was a moment in time that I never thought this was possible? I was called Doubting Thomas. And you're having a conversation with him. He says, boy, if I would have known then what I know now, I wouldn't have had any problems. Observations from a conversation, compelling conversation. For some folks, their affairs can be more important. For some folks, their assets can be more important. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Lastly, this. For some folks, verse 20, observations from a compelling conversation. For some folks, their adorations can be more important. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. I'm just going to go out on a limb of assumption with this one because I've been in it long enough to know that some people like to pull, can I call them heartstrings? How many conversations I've had with people and you, you, you have to compel them? As a pastor, you have to compel people. to can, can, can I just say this? Whether you take it as an apology or however you receive it, can I say this? I'm mandated by the throne of heaven to do everything within God's grace and my personality to compel you. To compel you to come. To compel you to serve. Compel you to give. For, to compel you to give, go, and grow. Every week i got to do that. Can I tell you how many times people try and get your heartstrings? Try and play on your emotions? Pastor. Pastor. I, I'll tell you what. If Brother Robideau hasn't helped in any other area, he's helped in this. I think all of us, the older we get, sometimes we can get softer. Any of you older men want to agree, women? I, I've heard my kids say on more than one occasion, but I'll tell you what, I wish... I wish Papa was the one raising me instead of Daddy. And so they try and get you with their, and they'll tell you stories. And, and I, but I still have to, just like Christ did, I still, so here's this guy, this is an assumption, he's doing the very same thing. I've been in it long enough to know that some people like to pull your heartstrings. And the limb of assumption that I'm asking you to go out on was that the last one thought that if they posed the answer that their newfound mate and marriage was more important, then surely the preparer of the great supper would understand and have me excused. I mean, it's my wife. Family matters, doesn't it? My personal opinions was that this person understood Old Testament custom where a newly married person was exempt from military service, going to war, soldiering, whatever, however you want to look at it, and thus misinterpreted that and misapplied it to his marriage and the invite to the supper. Here's a modern day way of doing this. Well, Sunday's my only time to be with my family. I'm sure you'll understand. You know, preacher, I work from... Monday to Saturday, and I don't really have any time to be with my family and my wife and my children, and I've got to spend time with them or I'm going to lose them, and Jesus wants us. You know, a man that won't work is worse than an infidel, and if I don't take care of my family, then, you know, how's God going to bless me and everything else? And they come up with all those kinds of excuses, and heartless pastor love it if he were to push back against that. It's just so cold and calloused. For some folks, their adorations can be more important. He twisted and misinterpreted and misapplied Scripture in my personal opinion. Surely family should always trump anything else. I mean, really, the Lord is very concerned for my family. And He is, but not to our harm and exclusion from the Great Supper. He expounds and explains and expresses that in the following verses. I thought this was very interesting in verse 25 or verse 24. He says, For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. The last one even kind of tried to pull on my heartstrings a little bit and says, I've married a wife. Surely I can be excused for that. Well, watch what he said. He said, and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, in his own life, also he cannot be my disciple. It's not that Christ is attempting to separate us from our family, but rather prioritize the family. If you don't have and desire a relationship with God as a child, 
then you'll scarcely represent and prioritize him to yours. I'll give you this illustration. We'll be done. I've said many times from a pulpit that I was a TV child. I had three channels and tried to find hope and help in the stories of families on TV because mine was so dysfunctional. I thought it was a peek into reality. In some aspects, it was. It helped me to realize that I was, there was real out there. There was functionality, if you could, outside of the walls of the house that I lived in. You've heard me use the illustration of John Walton from the Waltons. John Walton was somebody I looked up to as a little boy. Is that okay to say that? In my little warped world, he loved his family. He worked hard for his family. He'd do anything for them. He epitomized these people in our text, though. And when it was all said and done, if you watch all the later ones later on down the road, when it was all said and done, all the Walton kids grew up. None of them prioritized church. Every time he was invited, John said, I got to work in a sawmill. Got to take care of my family. I got to do this. Got to love my wife. Got to. Had all the excuses here. I know it's a simple, silly illustration from television, but can I tell you how many times that has come true in life? Prioritize it. Sir, your moderations today will be your children's excesses tomorrow. None of them prioritized church. Why? Because they saw John's adorations and followed after them. You may think that all your excuses have merit and validity, and in the proper context, they do, but not to the exclusion of Christ and His commission and great supper first. There's times when I just want to sit in the rafters of people's lives. Please. I'll go as far as to say this so you know I'm not preaching at anyone. My children can all stand up here and testify that every time they've tried to prioritize one of these things, assets, affairs, or adorations. One of them sent me a text the other day. On a day, they could have been at visitation. You never responded. Of course I didn't respond. I was doing the Lord's work, and you were trying to entice me to do the affairs that you wanted to be a part of. If I respond back and say, oh, man, oh, man, I would have loved to have been there. You know what I just emphasize? Affairs over the things that are more important. That way you can sit in here this morning and say, well, he's not on me, he's on somebody else. But I challenge you how many times you've been compelled by the messenger and still refuse to come. Someone's coming to the piano this morning. Can I say this is a messenger for a certain man? And as your pastor who cares for you deeply, maybe it's time to quit making excuses and come for all things are prepared and yet there's still room. It's a twofold invitation. Actually, if you're in here and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you miss that supper. And can I tell you what? It's going to be the greatest, grandest buffet you've ever seen with some of the choicest servants that God has ever called. Can I also say this? There's going to be some that aren't there because you never told them. Which side is God compelling you to come from His conversation? Father, we'd ask You to help us this morning. Please help us this morning. I'd hate to know when I got there, Lord, that somebody didn't get an invite and it was because of me. Help me in those areas. And Lord, also help me to be that servant that will be diligent to go out into the highways and the hedges and compel folks to come. And Holy Spirit, I'd ask you to speak to that one this morning that does not know and thinks that affairs and assets and adorations are so much more important than what you've prepared. I pray they'd forsake those things and follow that which is eternal. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Miss Grace is playing something on the piano. If God spoke to your heart this morning, I'm compelling you to come.
and they explain it. Grace uh, allows us the opportunity when we get to heaven to have our memories of things or else we'd live in eternity with the regret. But I didn't tell this one, I didn't tell that one, I didn't tell this one. So there's grace there. There's grace. We'll be in the, we'll be in the presence of grace. But hell's the absence of grace. You know why? For eternity, that rich man will stay there. For eternity, when you were bid to come and didn't come, you'll have the regret and the remorse of never coming when you were asked to come and miss out on the great feast. Well, I tell you what I think about that all the time when I preach. Wait, don't wait, don't wait. So Oliver B. Green used to always close out his invitations. Um, come before it's eternally too late. He'd say, God, please reach that one that's near as hell. Well, hope God gave you something this morning. Amen. Father, we thank you today for the scriptures. We thank you for the truths that are contained within your conversations. You were not soft. But yet, Lord, you are so subtle in wooing people to you. We have such a misrepresentation some days from your passion. It must have been very convicting to be in your presence and hear you talk to people. Help us to understand that sometimes when we hear messages from the scriptures concerning your conversations. Help us to go out into the highways and the hedges and compel and Lord, for those of us that may be in here this morning, please don't wait. Help us, Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. See you tonight. Brother Andrews, or choir practice? No choir practice. See you tonight. Don't forget the uh, curbside care ministry.